put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise to flatly go where no fan wanted it to. As previously established in Star Trek continuity, Zephram Cochran designs the first the first human designed warp capable engine and Vulcans make contact with Earth. And then according to this show, they spend a hundred years holding back information, refusing to share alien technology and information with humans. Major Vulcan characters on the show will break just about all of the established rules for Vulcans and early on they claim that they do not share humanity's interest in you know exploration which is absurd because that's how you gather information that's how you do science and being scientists is part of their core you know driving force as a species so the, the this of course sets up that you know humanity human beings have trouble believing Vulcans causing friction bigotry class warfare where you know other Star Trek shows were you know went out of their way to show that you know on earth and the surrounding you know the United Federation of Planets those were gone and I suppose you could say that you know this was the show was set before that you know those problems were dealt with but I don't think anybody wanted to see Vulcans and humans just straight up being you know xenophobic towards one another you know, sub subversion can be an excellent element of fiction, but it's not good just, you know, automatically. And it's not like Star Trek hasn't gotten plenty of solid conflict out of the rigid logic of Vulcans and the, you know, humans with our emotions and such. So, what is the point of this obvious and strange retcon? Why do... the the idea is that Vulcans don't believe that humans are ready for deep space travel. Why not have Vulcans on the side of humans and have a different alien species that you know this show could create out of just yeah, you know, it's it's already retconning, why not just make up a different species that then the Vulcans, along with the humans, have to try to convince to let humans out into space so that the, again, so that humans and Vulcans are still on the same side. And, you know, the, the Vulcans here are nothing like the Klingons of the original series or the Cardassians of Deep Space Nine. Those are villains that are fun to hate. You know, we, we want to see them as just, you know, they're, they're so deliciously evil and it's always fun to see the good guys, you know, beat them in, in one way or another. In this, Vulcans are just boot on our neck types that are keeping humanity down. And as far as hate goes, someone writing this definitely hated Vulcans. And Vulcan elements on, you know, core elements of Vulcan as, as a species 
are here seen as negative, you know, mind melds and such are here negative and again making, you know, Vulcans out to be the bad guy. It's very strange. The the idea is presumably that what is, you know, what what the situation is set up to be here is supposed to be, you know, changed over the course of the show, or at least, you know, before the time of the original series, which was set about a hundred years after this. And this is set in the 2150s, so 150 years from now. And for one thing, it's hard to see how this, how the perception would change so much between, you know, in a hundred years. But really, personally, I don't mind that. I don't think prequels have to explain how things got to where they are. I think that's actually something that really harms prequels when they go out of their way to work in canon and explain, you know, so suddenly Anakin Skywalker built C-3PO, you know, all these, and, you know, even, even when it doesn't contra contradict, just working in canon and saying this is how it got to be there, we don't need to see that. It's fine that C-3PO and R2-D2 were just randomly, you know, they were just two robots who happened to make it off that initial, you know, what was it, an ambassador's ship, you know, you don't need to make it more specific. It can be, you know, so, so I don't think that's not really what bothers me. You know, it's more important to make it interesting than to make sure that you work in the canon. The problem is that it's just, they're ruining the species. They're ruining Vulcans, who used to be, you know, the, these were the first aliens we were introduced to. And they're a lot of people's favorites. Even today, when we've met, you know, over the course of Starship, we've met hundreds of species, and yet the Vulcans still remain some of our favorite ones. And it's not only because, you know, it's it's not just because they were the first we saw, it's because they're so compelling. You know, other ones that we saw very early on maybe weren't as compelling. You know, some, some of them are, some of them aren't. But, yeah. And the... Frankly, it gets so bad in the show that we end up fearing Vulcan episodes, Vulcan guests and such, especially because they just bring us down. You know, so, to be fair, some, in spite of some mischaracterization and, again, odd retcons, Klingon episodes are often the opposite of this. Anyway, now Jonathan Archer gets the, you know, there's a, there's an unusual circumstance, and he was already about to go into deep space, but now he, he convinces the Vulcans of a, you know, taking a specific, specific mission to solve this unusual circumstance, and when this mission is a success, they're they're given the go-ahead to keep going out into space to explore. And they will fight various aliens, including the Suldaban, who alter their genes. The, it's, it's said early on, they don't really... They're essentially on the same stage as humans. They don't have special abilities or this or the like, but many of them will alter their genes to get special abilities, including, you know, becoming invisible, stretching, you know, reversing their joints, crawling on walls, ceilings, you know, granting rock skin and being on fire, throwing fire. 
actually scratch the, the rock and fire stuff. I don't know where that came from. One of the commanders of the Suliban are Silic, who is okay. He's no... He's nothing like Dukat, for example, of the Cardassians. Some of the new aliens are compelling. There are a lot of Deus Exes. I should say that this review is co-written by my ex-fiance, and we tend to... She's big into Star Trek. She's gotten me interested in, you know, with this I've watched all the actual Star Trek, meaning, you know, the, the shows... I haven't watched the JJ movies, so, as I said, all of the actual Star Trek. And we use shorthand, and common to Star Trek fans in, in shorthand is to call this, sh this show, Enterprise, Ent, E-N-T, which in Lord of the Rings is the name of these living trees, who, much like the show, are known to move slowly, heavy in their, you know, presence, talking slowly, saying very little, and generally being very tedious. Often, she and I would think harder about even major elements of episodes in the show than the writers did, and we would wonder how they managed to so severely underthink it. I, I can only imagine that the writers must have been exhausted from other activities before they sat down to write, because these scripts get severely lazy. I am going to be criticizing this show a lot, so if you just want to hear something positive about it, if you skip ahead to season four, that season is pretty much all good. There's, even at its worst, it tends to be better than the rest of the show. You should probably watch some episodes from the first three seasons just to get a handle on the characters. I don't personally have a, a list. I'd have to go back and rewatch, and I'm not doing that anytime soon to compile a list of ones that really set up the characters, but you can probably find that elsewhere. There are people who are far more into Star Trek than I am who've probably made lists like that. But yeah, if you're going to watch any of this at all, Season 4 is mostly good, and sometimes even great. I've already mentioned Jonathan Archer. He is the captain of this enterprise. Captain Furrowed Brow, who is determined, passionate, and wants, you know, very, very eager to satisfy his own sense of fairness, which is quite, you know, we, we can see where he's come from. He's, he tends to be on the right side of the conflict. And he's willing to break rules to satisfy this sense of fairness. And if he does not get to satisfy it, he can become very enraged, which that's a lot like this show in general. If, if things don't go the way of characters, even major ones, they will just, you know, break things or fringe. Jonathan has just been introduced. We're, we're a few minutes into the pilot when he threatens a Vulcan that he doesn't really know, it doesn't seem like, and who hasn't really done anything. She, she makes a single statement that, you know, speak against his, you know, the, the mission that he's intending, and he threatens to beat her, which sets the tone. Very nice. Actually, his character gets much better, but it sets the tone for the show quite nicely. He is one of the two Kirks of the show. He doesn't only respect or trust his crew, he genuinely likes them. He'll smile at them, he will 
if they come to him with personal problems, he'll, you know, listen to them and try to help. If they suggest different courses of action than he's intending, he'll also try to help, which frankly gets to be too much. He becomes part ship's counselor. When he's frustrated, he may be found in his quarters, Jack Torrancing in there. I have not watched Quantum Leap, but I get that that's a way better show and he's more charming there. Although he's, he's not bad in this, charm-wise and such. Unlike The Next Generation, in this show the captain does go on away missions, which I guess really means that the next generation is the only one where the captain doesn't go. It's almost like that one didn't really get that that was something fun. And anyway, yes, I know. To, people pointed out that if both the captain and the first officer goes on away missions, if something happens, they might both, you know, suddenly the the ship doesn't have either of the yeah still. This sees a return to, you know, very physical fights, much like in the original series, rather than, you know, there, there is some martial arts here as well, and it's not over-choreographed, it's, it's pretty good. But, yeah, and it's worth noting that in the original series, Shatner was in his, his 30s, Scott Bakula was in his 50s when he did this, and he was still, you know, the one doing a lot of the fights. So that's, yeah, props. He will sometimes Shatner. He clearly also wants to have fun on the mission. Early on, he lets the crew camp on a very Earth-like planet. Now, he has a cute dog, which is clearly, you know there to get get viewers who hope to, to see the dog and he brings it along on the ship quickly humanizing a captain by them owning a dog was done quite nicely on Voyager which did not in fact include the stupidity of taking your pet into space you don't even bring, like, a dog into a relatively exotic country without giving it a rabies injection a month before. Having it locked up on the ship is not going to be very good for it, and taking it to planets is going to risk sickness, infection, all-around negative outcomes for, you know, itself, other animals, you know, the, the ship's crew, aliens, and yes, he, he does exactly this, of course, and I, I can appreciate that it's not, you know, when, when bringing it onto the planet, it's not as if they, you know, is there air? They know, they can scan for that, but it doesn't even get through the first season without growling at another pet and seeming like it might have started attacking that pet if John hadn't shown up. It barely gets through the first season without becoming deathly ill. His second officer and science officer is T'Pol, the full Vulcan, who does not always go by logic, but of course she won't admit to that. And she occasionally has a sense of humor. We've had a Vulcan science officer, we've had a main character who was a full Vulcan, granted on two different shows, but this is breaking no new ground on that, yeah. And this was, of course, a Vulcan at, on, on an Earth ship at a time when Vulcans weren't very popular with human humans. Where, you know, Bones would tease Spock, it was very... It was like with with siblings, and uh, frankly, to Paul is a major buzzkill, which Spock and Tuvok aren't regularly, and you know weren't necessarily when it wasn't 
funny for them to be, you know, where they were our favorite characters, she's our least favorite characters. Scenes in this show with Vulcans never end, and I found myself very close to turning off the TV when, yeah, Spock and Tuvok, when they're introduced, they already clearly care about Kirk or Janeway, respectively, and Kirk and Janeway care about them. The, these two Vulcan characters provide calm, logical analysis of situations. T'Pol just kind of criticizes other people's ideas without offering up any of her own. She has this superior air to her, very the next generation. She comes across as just bitter and burnt out. She Like, she does not want to be there, which is strange because in the pilot, in the pilot, she, she isn't choosing to be on the ship. But at the end of the pilot, she does choose to stay on the ship. And, yeah, it just, either, you know, we, we respond to her seeming like this in one of two ways. Sometimes, you know, just, sometimes any one of us respond to her in either of those ways at just different times rather than, yeah, either we, we, you know, we try to sympathize and say you should, you should probably try to find another position. This this is not good for you. This is you're you're going to just get a bad case of stress. This is this is not healthy for you. Or we respond with fine, leave. Do you know how many people would die to be where you are right now? And just yeah. It, it would not be very difficult for her to be picked up by a Vulcan ship. Again, Vulcans have gone beyond. You know, they, they haven't explored, apparently, but they or not as eagerly as humans will. But, yeah, she could, she could be picked up by a Vulcan ship, hopefully off-screen, so we don't have to watch the Vulcan characters, but, yeah... Deep Space Nine and Voyager got characters that don't want to be there right. It caused conflict, not frustration, for everyone involved, including the viewer. You, the, there were times where you worried they would physically attack each other, and this allowed the shows to explore both viewpoints. The reason they had to be there was they were the best for the job, they physically literally had to be there. You know, the Maquis in Voyager are stuck there. They don't have another ship. They they just, they physically are stuck on this Federation ship. They don't want to be there, but what are they going to do? Jump out an airlock? So, you know, or the them being there is the best way to further their cause, much like Kira and Reese in Deep Space Nine. And we, we can see... You know, we, we can see why they are trying to further this cause, even if we don't agree with it. And casting Jolene Blalock? I have no idea. I've never seen her in anything else. As to Paul, of course, brings up that this show does not mind showing off sexy females, or males, to be fair, the, the Captain, Trip Reed, and Travis will also be shown off. I'll get into those. And she does act. She has talent. Sexualizing character does not come at the cost of talent. Or, you know, the, the ones that are just shown off then don't have lines or the like. You know, you're never stuck watching, you know, bad supermodel acting. It does, it is something that, you know, is worth criticizing the show for, and it's distracting to cast someone who is also, note I did not say only, pretty. She is actually a model, she, she came into this having been a model, so she was famous for looking good already, and 
frankly, there are times where she really just looks like an L.A. model. The show is more comfortable showing off sexy women than The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and, you know, it is at least rare that it's just there for TNA, you know, unlike Spike and Showtime. Of course, it is on UPN, so that's, you know, as in, you know, sister channel of the WB, as in Charmed, which I love Charmed, always will. Charmed is not Star Trek. I, I love both of them in different ways. You know, they... Yeah, I don't want either... I don't... When I watch Charmed, I don't want it to turn into Star Trek either. To to be fair, you know, in the original series, what with the miniskirts since it was the 60s, it, you know, it might be about as bad, and so so might Voyager be almost, you know, for reasons of certain characters in particular. To Paul's uniform is a cat suit. It, you know, it's it's curve hugging. It's worse than Counselor Troy's, you know. And we're not talking the Batman and Robin Batgirl, you know, rubber suit that kind of fits the the curves of her butt. No, no, we're talking about it's so tight that it highlights her cheeks, which also means that she's not wearing panties, which is in fact worse than. Jerry Ryan's character, who I won't be going into detail about so as not to spoil that aspect of a certain Star Trek show. Evidently, at the time, Jolene was not too rich to do crack. The decontamination is now done by sensually rubbing gel on themselves and each other. There's not a single scene of decontamination without there being a woman in the decontamination room. So they're at least not just even trying to hide the point of these scenes. Literally, there will be episodes where only males have to go through decontamination and the scene, it's, you know, it's never seen on screen. It's just referred to that that has happened. So, yeah, maybe it's the show's way of, you know, assuring the viewer no homo. There's, there's some hints of a romance. I'm not going to go into whether it goes into full but, but this is there from this is there in the pilot you know the very first decontamination scene is clearly hinting at some you know romance and yeah romance Vulcans do not romance Vulcans are paired up with a partner from childhood and yeah and another way this show goes against that whole thing, and, you know, every time there's this indication that there might be some kind of sexual, you know, my fiance after a while started referring to those, you know, those situations with Ponfar, Ponshmar, which, yeah, apparently. I suppose, yeah, if you've never watched, if, if you don't know too much about Vulcans, Ponfar is something that happens every seven years, and it's when a Vulcan kind of has to mate. And in that case, you know, sometimes this includes a fight. If the, if the Vulcan male and the his female mate is 
the 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 Vulcan male might have to fight another male over her, you know, company. And yeah, it used to be a really compelling concept on Star Trek that was used for incredibly. If you've ever heard, oh uh, wait. I've heard that YouTube recently has been like banning if you like sing or hum or if you've watched Cable Guy then my condolences and the scene where Jim Carrey and Ben S not Ben Stiller it's the, it's the Ben Stiller proxy he, the, the two of them are fighting in the arena in medieval times, the restaurant, with these things, and there's music, and Jim Carrey is even saying it's like this scene in Star Trek, and he quotes it. Yeah, that's from a Pon Far episode. Yeah, ev everybody knows that scene, and this show... <laughs> Yeah, sure, whatever. It's just canon, and this show is just trying to... There are times when it tries to fit in with canon, so it's they, they can't quite claim that they had no idea about canon. She's just about always sexualized, and given that she is not trying to attract a mate, since yes, she is indeed she's already been paired up so it's against her will which just makes it even worse the in general this show is not as progressive as it likes to think that it is and even if you say well the decontamination you know rubbing gel makes sense there's no reason for it to be this sensual other than trying to appeal to teenage boys in general, the show is trying too hard to attract people. And Star Trek has done romance. Star Trek has some very compelling romance, you know, subplots. And yeah, in in this in this they feel the need to do the whole sexual tension thing with people literally rubbing each other's bodies down, which Star Trek never felt the need to for romance. There's also a kiss to prove someone is trustworthy. They, they literally, right after the kiss, which is of course surprising to the other person, the, the character says, I've been given the ability to measure trust trustworthiness, something like that. but I have to be in close contact. So I suppose just like handshake or something that was would have been completely out of the question. Yeah. She doesn't actually specify that it's that it had to be a kiss, but yeah. Yeah. In addition to that, there's hand holding to calm down, kissing in order to cover a secret action two characters are tied back to back with you know yeah again for sexual tension there's a point where someone rolls to get out of a you know captivity and ends up with their face between the other characters breasts sexual dreams sexual assault in one sleep yep and playing up how sexy, you know, to Paul is to get out of a bad situation. Male characters will talk about how hot she is and very distinctly objectify her. Not not just say that, you know, there's something about her that really no, no, no just specific, you know, getting into like body parts and such. There's one scene after another in her quarters that are in part clearly to get her into her underwear and she'll p 
pout with her lips out. And yeah, the, the show doesn't want you to forget for a single second that they cast a hot model. Of course, the show is also quite willing to show off unappealing nudity, such as when the beard-bellied flocks strips. Yes. The pilot has chief officers staring at alien women who have you know, who extend their tongues, and this scene goes on for far longer than it has, than it all has to. And it was all over the ads just to make sure that people knew that there, there are hot chicks doing suggestive actions in this, so yeah, hope, hope that'll get you to watch. This feels more like a teen melodrama than smart sci-fi. She has sexual tension with pretty much every major male character on the show, main regular on the show, male regular on the show, except for Travis, again, get to him, which frankly gets to be uncomfortable because she's one of the only two female regulars and she's clearly the traditionally thought to be sexier of the two, so it feels like she has to be with one of the male characters. And yeah, just no Star Trek ever felt like that before. And all of them had at least one sexy or at least pretty female character. And, you know... I should mention that this, excuse me, even in, you know, even just guest characters, female guest characters will also often be sexualized or sexy. And yeah, the, this is also the, the first really, you know, sexual, sexually attractive as, you know, very overtly sexually attractive Vulcan. You might point to Kim Cattrall, but that is purely because of her later roles. Vulcans of either gender have always been highly attractive for their detached exterior. You want to see under there, find a way to get through, you know, crack that surface and see the full person under there. That you know, without that necessarily being any kind of sexual, but yeah, the and in this one they felt the need to fully sexualize the other shows that were on UPN or the WB include Everwood, Gilmore Girls, which to be fair I've only watched very little of, and only because my ex fiance want to show me some of it and okay so I didn't hate it One Tree Hill Dawson's Creek I was young Smallville and Supernatural there are others but you know those those are the ones that I can really compare it to that I've seen at least some of the first time T'Pol does the iconic Vulcan neck pinch, it looks like her fingers are temporarily toxic. To be fair, she does get better at it. And we do get our chronologically first mind melds. Apparently, human beings stink to Vulcans. This is said right in the pilot and also very often in an early episode. And it's something they will occasionally revisit. Before season three, her the iconic, very accentuated eyebrow just does not 
look right on her and apparently in those first two seasons she didn't want to like pluck her eyebrow and it's you know apparently like something you then always have to do so I understand that for you know someone who lives off modeling I do think that it might be something that someone playing a Vulcan might agree to the tone of her ear really sucks it doesn't it doesn't fit and it doesn't look like her real life you know the, the rest of her skin you can you can see where the makeup begins and ends and just I, I don't know I, I have to imagine that her ears are just constantly burning and presumably she is on the ship in part to bridge the gap between this shows Vulcans and the Vulcans of the original series, which was unnecessary if they hadn't pointlessly retconned them, and obviously recapture some of the magic of Spock and Tuvok. You know, the whole logic versus emotion thing, which was much more, you know, conflict, which was much more compelling with the two aforementioned Vulcan characters. Spock was the first Vulcan we ever saw, and he is half Vulcan, meaning that he is trapped between the, you know, he has to find his place between these two cultures. Tuvok was on a seemingly endless mission with no pauses in between, and she had to be the rock for her captain and longtime friend who had to keep morale high and Starfleet principles alive in a situation where many would you know give in to hopelessness and yeah become less disciplined and he also had to deal with Neelix teasing him although both clearly did you know respect also you know respect each other as well and that brings us to the third lieutenant and chief of engineering trip charles tucker the third and since he's the third trip triple he he eats with the captain and to paul at the you know officers table or whatever it's called and they will sometimes argue about you know a mission or the like there he is very excitable and wants to explore he is the friend and longtime officer of the captain much like bones and spock dax and tuvok the next generation didn't really have one the the two are good together with humor and shorthand but trip does come off somewhat dumb and immature which is not at all like the aforementioned characters he's the second of the two kirks and he has this he's he's southern and he has the southern charm going and the actor can really act Sometimes several episodes in a row will have him in an embarrassing situation to the point where he almost becomes a joke. And he's not only useless but downright dangerous when he is scared. He, he becomes a liability. He's far too impulsive. Bones had the southern passion and spoke his mind, but he was still composed when he had to be. He is a great engineer. That brings us to Lieutenant Reed, the tactical officer, which means he's primarily there to deal with external threats. He's British, very reserved, old fashioned. He's the latest in a long line of Royal Navy men. 
he early on is seen to be willing to give his life in order to save the crew. He does sometimes also act as a security officer, meaning dealing with threats on the ship itself. And where every other, basically, pretty much every other security officer we've seen was an alien specifically, you know, very capable for the job, I will, I already explained this in my Voyager review, so I will be annotating a link to that bit. Here he's just a human being, but to be fair, he is determined. Early on, he says he likes to Paul, more specifically, Hebum. He is thus a perverted misogynist who is just creepy around women, ogling them, and clearly just wanting sex. Maybe they thought they were giving us another Harry Kim, but Harry was sweet and naive, and he was cute, you know, he, he fell in love really easily, and he was unlucky in love. Yeah, it was, you know, you, you felt bad for the guy when it, you know, when he was trying to, you know, yeah, trying to charm a young lady. But Reed is just fixated on Paul and jumps at the chance to have sex with alien women and the like. He could easily outperv his Jim Carrey namesake, and yes, there are times where it's fun to just pretend that you're watching Liar Liar, as someone calls him Mr. Reed. And he he is cautious without being a T'Pol level buzzkill. And he's often immature and will whine about his role on the ship. I don't know if it's coming across, but I'm having a blast tearing the show a new one. I inflicted it upon myself, but it is still rather satisfying. I hope you're enjoying yourself as well. Now... The Doctor is our Discount Neelix, I mean Phlox, who is Denobulin and uses alien cures to great effect. So yeah, it's, it's Neelix. They want him to be Neelix. And trying to recapture the, the magic of Neelix, which to be fair, Tuvok was as well, both Neelix and Tuvok being on. Star Trek Voyager, but Tuvok is an interesting character, and it had been 10 years since we had last seen Spock in the movie, and just, yeah, there was, it, it was not immediately after the show had ended that they then tried to recapture the, yeah, the magic of another character. He the, the actor described it as having been written as having a zen-like placidity, which is very useful in a doctor and very boring for a character. The, you know, they, they do occasionally bring him out of it, which is necessary for conflict, but yeah, it's, and, and the dude can act. He does, you know, when they bring him out of it, it doesn't feel like you're watching someone completely else. He makes it part of the character, but yeah. And he is very eager to learn new cultures, sometimes by full immersion. He is the second non-human doctor that Star Trek has had, the first one being Voyager's doctor, doctor, who was far more interesting. He has a creepy smile. He is sort of the non-human who gives perspective on human characters, but nowhere near the, the level that the other shows have had where, yeah, you know, more compelling characters and 
characters better equipped to really point out interesting things about human beings and such. It's not entirely clear why he's the one on the ship. He's part of this medical exchange program. You know, he he's not from Earth, so he is... Yeah, he, he knows more about aliens than maybe human doctors, because, again, humanity has been kept on Earth, mostly. You know, there, there have been, there, there are like cargo ships that went beyond Earth, but not very far, not, not into deep space. So, yeah, he knows a lot, but that's, it, it seems like he, he's barely, he's basically there. He has a role to play in the pilot, and after that he just stays on the ship. And, yeah, I, I don't know, I suppose maybe he's the best qualified, I'm not, I'm trying to remember if they mention other people who were part of the medical exchange program who aren't, like, he keeps writing to this other doctor, Dr. Lucas, who's human, who, you know, the two exchange, you know, change places kind of thing, I think. I'm not entirely sure that before the pilot episode that there were, you know, particularly other doctors who had been into deep space and were, you know, on Earth and actually I'm not entirely sure that he has been to deep space, but he knows a lot about other cultures and has all these alien cures, so I guess he's the best by default. Again, the other cases, it was someone eminently qualified that was more or less chosen to be there for being eminently qualified. This, it's just, he's the best we got. And I suppose the, you know, Starfleet Medical will just have to find somebody else. You know, if he really is the only one who can do that much. Yeah, quickly educate someone else, I guess. I don't think that, like, like I said before, the writers really did not think this through very much. A lot of the way, at least. Anyway, he he clearly cares about the his pets, the, the alien life forms that he uses for cures. He won't let them die. He'll very, you know, he's very happy to be feeding them and like the like. They're basically like pets. You know, they just happen to also really be useful. And he is very principled in his practice of medicine until the third season where his ethics go right out the airlock and just disappear completely. And like to Paul, he is a boring regular cast member who's an alien. We've had Vulcans when, you know, when viewers didn't know what Vulcans were. We've had a an android who yearned to be human. We've had a half Klingon, several half Klingons. We've had a a symbiont, meaning Dax, who has the the knowledge and weight of many lives before hers. I think it's like half a dozen or so. And just we've we've had a shapeshifter, but sure, why not? Let's just make him completely uninteresting. Travis is the pilot, and he grew up on his family's cargo ships, and he is very experienced as a pilot, having piloted his father's cargo ship. See, Enterprise, you do know how to establish how a character is excellent, not just, you know, the only one who could more or less fulfill the job and sort of just the default. Anyway, yeah, he is, you know... He's more comfortable on spaceships than on Earth, really. And 
he now wants to explore now that he has the chance and he's excitable which tends to translate into a lot of goofy smiles but he is a great pilot and can do some really compelling you know maneuvers he sometimes takes the captain's chair not like from the captain but when he's the only one on the bridge and he shows that he's really you know he has leadership potential and he gets into alien sports and gets hurt every single time he's one of the best characters in the show and he's hardly used at all which does of course make us wonder is he the best and they don't use him much or is he the best because they don't use him much and the less we see of anything on the show the better. Hoshi is the communications officer. She's an expert at languages. And she is, of course, scared of space, you know, space travel, spaceships. She's claustrophobic and it becomes annoying in part because she's whiny about it. So, yes, the only two female main characters are both annoying they even start out combative towards one another for petty reasons at that which gives us the first Star Trek where the two major female characters fight over petty reasons which is a stereotype dating back to when women had no power and the only way they could get it was via the powerful man they were with and thus women would have to you know every woman would always have to see any woman they weren't related to as someone who could possibly take their man away from them and thus render them you know throw them you know out on the street more or less you know depending on how far you go back but yeah you know great job enterprise great job she lacks confidence which is really makes her the first female character, major female character on Star Trek, and regulars at least, who are such. And yeah, again, subverting expectations isn't necessarily interesting. And I'm not saying that all female characters have to be strong, but this is a ship. This is a spaceship going off out into the universe. You need the people to be incredibly able and preferably incredibly confident as well the you know this is not the place to have a female character who starts out even starts out lacking confidence at times you get a real Troy vibe from her she's kind of the you know the human universal translator because those aren't fully functional yet and you know she has to kind of help program them, you know, fill them in. And she does have some Lieutenant Barclay going, you know, some paranoia, and in spite of that, he, she really doesn't garner our sympathy. We're kind of just annoyed by her, and Dwight Schultz is a man who can really get our sympathy when he is just completely helpless and out there. The characters are not that interesting, and it is possible that it would have gotten better if the show had gotten more than four seasons since, you know, these Star Trek shows, other than the original series, tend to use the first three seasons to establish character, and they can be kind of painful, <sighs> you know, less so with Deep Space Nine and somewhat less so with Voyager, so I guess I'm really just saying that the next generation is where they're kind of painful. But in this, they don't do that much to establish and develop characters, and yeah, the, the episodes are just painful. And the, the third season 
is completely eaten up by a stretched out filler ridden arc which is boring and just where the third season starts could have been where the first season started pretty much there are a few reasons why it didn't and maybe it's best that it didn't but nothing happened in the first three seasons that meant that 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 needed to happen before which you know and and again we have the thing that at the you know at the start or end of the third season of the Star Trek show again not in the original series we have a major event that really affects what comes after and yeah in this in in the other shows excuse me there were things that needed to happen before that event in and in part they were also developing characters but the you know I wouldn't I I love the what what came of it in both Voyager and Dark, Deep Space 9 but I would not want either of those shows to start with the major event that then changed everything after it it would have been too loaded there would have been too much the concept in itself was enough and in this the concept in the first three seasons is just okay let's go into deep space and explore and really that could have been that could have taken place before the pilot and then the pilot be the actual event that yeah that season three yeah and the 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 cast here never gel to a family so somewhat like the next generation as well and again unlike the other shows the cast are pure chameleons having to play themselves being taken over by aliens and the like halfway through season one we've had three separate cases of one episode where they meet and fight the alien and then a second episode where they help and are helped by the alien. The pilot was the the first episode of for two different alien species of that. And we are also again cursed with near perfect characters. So again, like the next generation. You might be able to sense that the next generation is not my favorite Star Trek show. The th this also doesn't do well at teaming up characters with other characters. It tends to be just the same two characters that you know, Archer and Trip. You know the Reed and sometimes Trip. Anyway, yeah, they will team up the same two characters over and over, and yeah. There are a lot of stupid choices being made so that an episode can happen. There is really terrible dialogue that you know is only spoken so that the the viewer can be told what the characters clearly should know and sometimes really what the viewer should know as well. They clearly did not think much of their viewership when writing this. And where seasons one and two are fairly standalone, much like the original series, I already mentioned the arc in season three, and season two, season four has several two to four episode arcs that tend not to be marked part one and two and such, which are mostly good. And just, yeah, in, in general, season four is mostly good. This has guest appearances by the awesome Jeffrey Combs, making the original series and the animated series the only ones that he did not guest on. And the... not counting the fourth season, which again is mostly good, we have 76 episodes total and 25 good ones. So 
Yeah. As as a third. Slightly less. That's that's not very good. And episodes can be really, really boring. Some teasers really boring. Like this this is the time where the show should grab you and have you returning after the commercial break, after the intro. Yeah, this often fails at that. And even when even when there are twists and good action, good acting, good concepts, often you just don't care because you're not invested. I didn't find it rage-inducing, but it might be for real Trekkies. And sometimes the show is just frustrating and obnoxious. Even episodes directed by previous Star Trek cast members are often bad, when those would often turn out to be our favorite episodes of, yeah, which, again, it's just, they, they couldn't save they, they couldn't, you know, there's only so much you can do with the material you're given. There are a lot of writing inconsistencies. After a while, I noted that if it's a new scene, you can't be sure that they're going to stay true to even important details and such. There's a lot of, what am I even watching? It's just decent, not that compelling, not that interesting even though it is mostly fairly well produced to just like you know visuals and sets and the like sometimes it is really really badly produced and yeah you know makeup sets designs sometimes very good and the effects are pretty good you know it's they're they're on a network budget and it's early cgi so yeah, but it's it's pretty good. The problem is, it's early CGI, so it has the horrible hallmarks of early CGI, meaning it's overused. They didn't imagine; they couldn't possibly imagine that it would ever, you know, date. That it would ever not hold up, and they, you know, they use it in place of the plot rather than in service of it. The pilot is very meh. It's easily the worst Star Trek pilot, but then, you know, the next generation has a good pilot. The the unaired pilot of the original series, because it didn't have an aired one, Voyager's pilot and Deep Space Nine's pilot are great. So it does have a lot to, you know, try to beat in that regard and it's actually it's it has good production values it has a lot of action there's good amount of plot going on but it's just not very engaging and the pilot is very bad at showing off how much money went into it because you can tell but a lot of it is just in the background they they'll like focus on aliens and they'll pretty much look human or be kind of boring and just yeah and the action is also often just kind of it's the the concepts and the execution just aren't that compelling and yeah for a show partially driven by action that's that's a really big failing the season finale of the first season is great and the season opener and finale of season two, the season opener of season three, and the season opener of season four are good, and the season finale for season three and season four, meaning the series finale, and they knew that it was the series finale, are both terrible. Writing sometimes There's, there's a lot of lazy writing, just so episodes can go the way the writers intend, sometimes for them to even happen at all. 
the 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 show predates the prime directive and the united federation of planets they can only go to about warp 4.5 and starfleet and the starfleet academy do exist and at, in the pilot the ship is barely ready and the tech has barely been tested because they are making this very sudden trip but that does also mean that we have a little bit of star trek the motion picture going on where some of the time they're just hoping that the ship will hold together and it's just kind of we that's not what we watch star trek for we want to meet aliens we don't want to see the ship fall apart in front of our eyes it's you know we we want to see the the best team do what they do best and do really well at it we don't want to see this half put together team of some who maybe even shouldn't be there and maybe shouldn't even be there and technology that you can't be sure if it'll actually work and the we see some species that we know from other Star Trek and Sometimes they're retconned horribly, sometimes they have their character assassinated. They sometimes put light episodes in between more heavy ones to make it, you know, not so, not too heavy, much like other Star Treks have done. This could be the first Star Trek you watch. It does explain, you know, impulse, speed, warp, phasers, and such. But if you, if this is the first Star Trek you watch, you might not watch any of the other ones because this sucks so badly. So I do implore you to watch some of the others and consider watching the fourth season of this. To yeah. And the before season four, few episodes would really have you coming back for the next one. Before I started watching this, I owned the series and I had decided that I was going to watch the whole series, no matter what. If not, if, if either of those weren't true, I probably would have quit even early on and certainly later the show didn't give me many reasons not to quit either again only the fourth se fourth season now there are times when you wonder if these people watched star wars the phantom menace and thought brilliant let's do that it gets really repetitive several episodes will have two similar ideas you know close to each other so it's like they couldn't really there's there's a term when you're writing you have to kill your darlings you have to get rid of ideas that you love but that just don't work or that just make the story too long or the like and it seems like they just weren't willing to here so they just used everything Some of the behind-the-scenes people on this are the same as the modern Treks. I believe at least Deep Space Nine Voyager, possibly the next generation as well, which might be part of why this doesn't have a distinct voice of its own, where Deep Space Nine, for example, brought in Ira Stephen Burr, who, since watching Deep Space Nine, I have forgiven for the 4400, you know, he he gave it a very distinct voice, and yeah, this didn't. Early episodes will sometimes rip off 90s Michael Bay movies, which is not only plagiarism, but a horrible place to get your ideas from. 
there are certain technology and races and planets and such that we see for chronologically the first time in this and they just they aren't earned this crew don't deserve to invent this or that or discover this or that and it's again the as a prequel they may be felt that they had to introduce all all these things that are later in you know that are seen later and are later established as something they already did know about and yeah there are, when when it tries to stay true to canon it feels like it just redoes episodes from the other shows that were far better and didn't need redoing when they were on the other shows and the the mission might take years because they don't have any bases far from Earth and my ex-fiance and I agreed that this should be graded on a curve I still don't to quote two and a half men it's stupid in a straight line this did 9-11 porn back you know before it was cool back when it was just too soon you might say it pioneered 9-11 porn if you were stupid and this unnecessarily redoes episodes that were great on the other shows and they're often just not good to hear and that in addition to canon stuff and much like the next generation and the JJ films they shouldn't have named the ship I know that the JJ films are also prequel and also supposed to be about Kirk and such like the original series but they should have named you know it shouldn't have been a prequel for one thing but yeah name the ship something else you know do like Voyager did and just so that people aren't having to compare enterprise ships it it never really goes well it just yeah some of the humor gets too silly and child friendly for Star Trek which when you consider that a lot of Star Trek hum humor is already silly they you know they went into other types of humor in the next generation and you know well okay maybe after the next generation but yeah so it's again it's it's remarkable how low this manages to set the bar and still not meet it food in this show doesn't make a lot of sense they don't have replicators yet they also didn't really on the original series though they do have what's it called a cur curry machine for drinks they mention a chef I think once we do at least see his body which you know I until then I was working on theory that he was just an elaborate mythical being that everyone was keeping alive through a just a, an agreed upon you know contract that they would never mention that this man does not exist but then we do see his body that one time which means that he's sort of an alternate Wilson the the food they could not possibly store enough food again they don't have bases to yeah get more at and they're not big fans of what the Vulcans eat so they couldn't get ships yeah they supposedly have a hydroponics garden that it it isn't seen and even what it supposedly holds yeah Voyager had a hydroponics garden they would trade some of the technology that they had from the Alpha Quadrant which wasn't in the Delta Quadrant I want to say 
I get mixed up which of the two shows, Deep Space Nine, I think Deep Space Nine is Gamma Quadrant, and Voyager is Delta Quadrant, but yeah, you know, they were trading this technology that they had in the Alpha Quadrant that nobody else had in this quadrant, and they would harvest off planets, and they would they have to eat some things that were that they weren't very used to that Neelix would prepare and you know still be on rations and the like and here Cena mentioned no tra no trade scene are mentioned they don't travel as fast or as far as Voyager by half as in you know warp speed by half and yeah they're not in they're, they're in the Alpha Quadrant, so there's no going, yeah. And where, you know, the Next Generation and Deep Space Nine was in Federation-established space, so they could just recharge replicator power. You know, in the original series, I'm not sure we know a lot about, a lot of details about it, but they had these disks that they would put in a machine, and then out would come the meal. And... If it's just about storing disks, I mean, it's, yeah, the ship could have a huge storeroom full of those tiny disks. That that wouldn't be a problem at all. And then occasionally, off screen, they're going back to a base and getting even more of these disks. And I'm not even sure that those disks would have to be specific. It's entirely possible that you just put in a disk and then input, like, a, a code or something, or you tell the disc what you want the food to be or something that yeah it's maybe a bit fanciful but it was 60s sci-fi so yeah things like that yeah in this show mentioned or seen eaten is peanut butter jelly pecan pie pineapple any fish apparently honeydew melon banana apples grapes so they apparently they have trees they have room for vines <laughs> between the food and the dog i don't think that you know as far as creature comforts go i don't think that writers knew understood or cared possibly all three that they were in space in the future and not on earth in a modern city other examples include includes that trip apparently rode a VW bug and Reed was expected to enter the and his father was in the Royal British Navy. I I think it's interesting that they think that the royal system would still be in place in England in 150 years and that, that Britain presumably looks about the same. Reed has a typical British accent as we know it today, so apparently that hasn't changed. And they apparently still have a major navy when, when they're preparing to go into deep space. Yeah, Th there is a scene in at least one scene in this exercise room where the monitors and the exercise equipment look like they just got them from a store. They don't look futuristic at all. The continuity is largely as soft as The Next Generation and the original series. The third season is pretty much as hard as Deep Space Nine, you know, it's it's to the point where in the third season, they, they were made to, it wasn't entirely their own decision, but yeah, they were made to make an, an arc to make it more continuity heavy. And yeah, it, like with Deep Space Nine, watching season three, you have to be Excuse me, you have to be committed. And if you like season three, you probably will be committed. You have to watch all of the episodes in a row in relatively close proximity. You have to make sure you don't forget things. And yeah, that was also where a number of people 
completely abandoned the show. And there is, of course, the theory that this was because they just couldn't, you know, they, they maybe missed an episode or they were worried they might miss an episode. It makes for a good excuse, I would say, even if that isn't the case. And the, you know, there, there is some character continuity. Plots can be pretty one-off. Now, apparently, this, this prequel was made because it was deemed pointless to make another ship show, otherwise just, you know, have the next generation crew out there. You know, both Deep Space Nine and Voyager are very different in their base concept from the original series and the next generation. The original, you know, yeah. Kirk and Picard, it was basically just, you know, we're going out there and we're exploring. And, yeah, Deep Space Nine, it's, it's locked in a certain position, but then also giving room to explore a completely uncharted area of space. And Voyager is seemingly stuck in an in another uncharted area of space. So, yeah, if they just made another, you know, we're just going out and exploring in the Alpha Quadrant, then why not just the next generation crew? And this was also when this, you know, the, the last movie with Picard and his crew came out around the same time. You know, it came out as this show was airing, you know, so... Yeah, it, it seemed like if, if they're going to do another going off in the Alpha Quadrant, why not just... They're, they're still... They're in the movie. Why can't they just do, you know, ignoring, of course, the fact that they had been doing that since 87. But still, you know, they, they maybe ran out of other concepts. So, yeah, they made a prequel, which means they have to fit it into canon, which they often fail at. They have to make the technology less advanced. So in place of a tractor beam, they have a grappling hook. The phasers and communicators are big and clunky and kind of look like toy guns, water pistols. And this apparently had no Star Trek writers returning, so there might have been a bit of a JJ effect. You know, people who grew up not really fans of Star Trek and didn't really know what you know, how Star Trek was supposed to work. To be fair, I have not watched the J.J. movies. I'm basing this on what I hear. It is, however, what, you know, I base it on the fact that almost everything I hear seems to suggest that's the case. And I do, I mean, I've listened to spoilers about both movies. I know a ton of what happens who's in them, how they deal with things. So, yeah, but uh, no, I probably won't ever watch them. So to be fair, no, I can't say for sure that J.J. didn't, you know, well, he, he himself said in an interview that he didn't really, he wasn't really a fan. So, yeah. The show opens with the pop song, known pop song, Faith of the Heart sung by a sound alike. It's catchy and it fits the hopeful tone, but it's a cheesy pop song for Star Trek. And in season three, it's made even poppier, which makes it even worse considering what season three is about. And just, yeah, it, it really, and, and other than that, you know, where the others had these grand orchestral scores, you know, and the actual, you know, instead of showing the ship out in space, this has a nicely edited, if, you know, heck, maybe just turn, you know, mute the sound when you watch the intro because, yeah, it's, it's otherwise quite nicely done. And it has this hopeful future tone of, you know, it's, it's edited together by archive footage, simulations, stills, and such, designs, of various vessels, you know, showing human humanity creating these vessels, some of them named Enterprise, to go, you know, to explore the unknown through hundreds of years, you know, going out on the ocean in 
large ships going under the sea in submarines, you know, using hot air balloons to travel around the world, meaning that this enterprise ship is just another step in human exploration. And yeah, I mean, if they just removed the pop song, I'd be more or less fine with it. The show has almost a hundred episodes. I believe it's 98 total, and we never get used to the pop song. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump off it now. I promise. Unlike Deep Space Nine Voyager, this does not learn any lessons from the next generation, and thus, it is not tighter, faster, or more well executed than the next generation's generation. <clears throat> This was too late for a prequel show. We've, you know, over the course of Star Trek, we've been through two wormholes, covered a hundred, hundreds of years of future. If, if a prequel show came out before the next generation, sure, that would be fine. But yeah, at, at this point, it's just, like I said about the Vulcans, it's not what anybody really wanted to see. It's just, yeah, and there are times where this doesn't even live up to the standards of a teen melodrama. This is a smaller, more personal ship like the original series and Voyager, and unlike The Next Generation, it does look bigger on the outside than the original series Enterprise, which is baffling since it has less than a fourth of the crew capacity. I don't know, maybe it's a reverse TARDIS. The show was cancelled because of terrible ratings, and one ongoing issue is that not all characters really have something to do in the episode. When you know, when you have a good episode in the show, that tends to be that they actually give everyone something to do, and that it's an interesting solution to a, a problem that doesn't have a very obvious solution. But yeah, a lot of the time, obvious problems, obvious solutions, a lot of the characters that just don't have anything to do in the situation and just, you know, it spins its wheels to get to 42 minutes and we, you know, we watch, we check our watches just as much as they are and we're hoping it'll end and they're hoping it'll last. I've reviewed other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.